Hello and welcome to Long COVID Physio Podcast. My name is Darren Brown. I am a physiotherapist and I have experience of living with Long COVID. And today we have someone who I'm very excited to speak with today. We have Todd Davenport. Todd, would you do us the honor of introducing yourself? Thank you, uh, Todd Davenport. I'm currently professor and vice chair with the Department of Physical Therapy School of Health Sciences at University of the Pacific, which is in Stockton, California. Uh, Stockton is about 90 minutes optimistically east of the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, and so uh, we're, we're close enough that we can drive, but not close enough that we can actually see the water. <laughs> <laughs> well, I must admit that's a neck of the woods I've actually never been to. I would love to go travel around that part of the world, but I've never been. It doesn't feel like it's going to happen anytime soon. But does your does your background, uh, is, is that what the weather is like at the minute? It looks very sunny and rosy. It's close. So I think this picture would be taken around April or May when the roses start. So we have a big rose garden on campus. Uh, but the, the the campus looks leafy like this uh, almost all year. Uh, the trees are starting to get their leaves again, and it's a uh, it's a fun time of the year. Uh, Northern California is a pretty temperate climate, so it's, uh, yeah, yeah. it's quite unlike most other places in the world. Oh, very nice. Well, I know that I also look different to other podcasts today because I was working in intensive care at the weekend. So I've had to shave my face so that I could wear the right masks. So I look very different and I really don't like my face without a beard. So I'm hoping that people are listening to this and not watching at the moment. <laughs> so Todd, I know that we have we've been kind of following each other on Twitter for quite some time, haven't we? And I, I actually don't know how that kind of manifested, but obviously our worlds have collided of late, um, mostly around some of your work uh, that you've done in the past around, uh, I, I, well, I'll, I'll ask you that in a second, what your work is, but particularly around now coming into long COVID. So yeah. I was wondering, would you be able to tell us a little bit about the work you've done historically? Uh, sure, um, I'll, I'll give you a, a little bit longer version just for, for some context. So uh, when I was in, in physical therapy school, uh, I worked in a, a, the basic science lab, a wet lab. Uh, we were interested in the morphology of the neuromuscular junction in response to uh, anabolic and androgenic steroids with the intention of understanding how uh, people with muscle wasting diseases uh, like HIV AIDS might respond uh, in terms of increasing muscle mass and what the, what the alpha motor neuron might have something to do with. And so I sort of started on this track of being very uh, interested in folks who, are, who have fatigue for various different reasons and weakness for various mm. different reasons uh, and turned that into an experience uh, with a fellowship, uh, a pre pre-doctoral fellowship at the National Institutes of Health uh, there in Maryland, uh, where I helped to validate some physical assessment scales for people with inflammatory muscle disease. So again, another type of fatigue. Um, and so as we were kind of working through some of those publications and getting some of that work out, um, I was uh, sort of doing a career change, uh, wanted to get into academia full time. Uh, and so ended up uh, that uh, University of the Pacific hired me about 14 years ago. I'm not sure why, but I'm fortunate that they did and it's worked out well. Um, and I noticed that right when I got on campus, I was browsing you know, the web to find out who I knew and, and, and what kinds of relationships I could form. And, and lo and behold, there was this thing called the Pacific Fatigue Lab. Okay. Uh, and I thought, well, I know a little about fatigue and you know, I'm a physical therapist and, and you know, this was housed in health exercise and sports science department and uh, with a group of, of exercise physiologists and so I just sort of knocked on the door and said what are you doing <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's that serendipity you know that uh, I met uh, the executive director of the uh, Pacific Fatigue Lab uh, the Workwell Foundation uh, which is sort of how everyone knows it now uh, Stacy Stevens and uh, they've been working with Mark Van Ness and, and Dr. Chris Snell and in the group ever since. And so there's been about a dozen years now of research and practice specifically in post-viral forms of fatigue, uh, specifically MECFS. Mm. Um, and so I know we were, as we were chatting before we hit record, uh, this is an area of, of, of really an underserved area, underfunded area uh, as it relates to, uh, especially relative to the disability that people have. 
yes. a profound disability that people have. And the hope, of course, a dozen years ago was that as we started to learn more about the underlying physiology of MECFS and started to, uh, uh, that hopefully pointed to a biological basis and a cure that there would be less of a need for my research, that <laughs> we, would, we would start to phase this out. But unfortunately, the pandemic caused us to have other plans. Yeah, so that that to me is absolutely fascinating because obviously my um, my area of interest is actually and clinically my area of interest as a physiotherapist is in the context of HIV, um, and we know that people that have uh, uncontrolled advanced HIV that may be uh, an AIDS defining illnesses have, as you say, uh, that that muscle wasting, and it's really interesting. That's kind of where you started, and then moved into this area of fatigue, and we know that many people living with lots of different chronic health issues experience fatigue but I'm guessing that your work looked at a subset of a different type of fatigue I'm guessing uh, with your work in the work found foundation is that is that yeah. the case it, that is correct so um, and incidentally that's how I think I started following you on Twitter as I, I noticed your clinical expertise and, and sort of remembered my own roots and my, my now my interest in post viral fatigue and so that's yeah. how I how I came to uh, to connect with you there, but uh, but yeah, so so the, uh, the the common joke when I tell people that I work in the area of MECFS or chronic fatigue is they go, oh, I know, right? I'm tired too. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> this is this is not just tired, as you know. Um, this is not just didn't get enough sleep or stressed out at work or you're having you know having other other you know, sort of issues that are causing pressures. That, that yeah, are absolutely. Um, this is something very, very different. And so the first the first level of, of education for the uninitiated is simply that, yeah, we talk about fatigue, but this isn't really fatigue. It's, it's, it's well beyond that. Yeah, and I was going to ask you that, actually, because I think before my own personal experience of having post-viral complications with long COVID, I'd worked clinically for a long time working with people with fatigue, uh, particularly in the context of HIV and cancer. Um, but I don't know that I'd ever really come across this type of post viral fatigue. It seems very different to what I've heard other people talk about, um, which I find very surprising, particularly in the context where I've worked before in HIV, that, that th this type of fatigue doesn't seem to really present like that. But I wondered if you could maybe characterize or describe this what is this post-viral fatigue? Yeah, so so this type of fatigue and it, it is and fatigue isn't a good word for this. No, we, just, <laughs> we, don't, we don't have a good word. So we use fatigue, but it's the wrong word. And and let me explain at least according to the patients that I've listened to over the past yeah. dozen or so years how they've described it. They've described it as nothing in the tank. Uh, they've described it as um, as the battery is, is drained, they've described it as absolutely nothing left. They've described it as bonked, right? We've made up our own word now because, because and, and we're borrowing from endurance runners who collapse across the finish line because they absolutely can't bear to take another step. There's just, yeah. there's just no energy substrate left to do it. Um, and so, so that's, that's the fatigue. And, and so when we think about that scale of fatigue uh, between I didn't sleep well last night and I need to sleep better to totally bonked, can't get out of bed because I can't raise my head. Um, I can't talk mm -hmm. because it's metabolically too costly. Um, they really don't belong in the same definition, uh, but we're, we're a little limited by the words that we have. Yeah, I really like that as a concept there, because I think that not only are the words tired and fatigue interchangeable, but clearly there's a scale of severity, isn't there? And also presentation with this fatigue. And maybe in, in our language, we don't have the, the words that describe the nuances in that wide diversity of symptom. Right. And I think so what we've done, I think, in order to, at least the Workwell Foundation has done, and uh, the work that I've been a part of is to try and characterize what we mean when we say fatigue. Yeah. Um, and, and we've done this a couple of different ways. The first way we've done it is to try and characterize the underlying physiology mm -hmm. of, of what we characterize as, as fatigue. 
Yes. Uh, and so we've we've compared people in our case, not with long COVID because the work predated the pandemic, but we used uh, we've we've been working with people who have myalgic encephalomyelitis or chronic fatigue syndrome or um, um, or or whatever label that that we want to use because there's many different labels, uh, partially owing to the fact that this fatigue is is a loaded term, um, and partially because uh, actually the the way things started off with the uh, the ICD classification. It was initially classified as a neurologic disease, mm -hmm. uh, as myalgic encephalomyelitis. Uh, this is this is back uh, with with Ramsey's work, um, well well before my time in, in the field. And so, um, you know, what what we have now is is also symptom characterizations as a result of of our work with the Workwell Foundation, and not, not just our not just our work, but there's there's other folks who have done done the same thing. So I, Lenny Jason with DePaul University here, uh, Lily Chu's group at Stanford um, have have also done a lot of work to characterize symptoms, and um, uh, I think Carolyn Carolyn Kingdon uh, has has done some work there too. Uh, in terms of trying to measure and, and quantify the symptom experience mm. of, of MECFS as being, and, and trying to compare it across different fatiguing health conditions. Oh, yeah. um, so we, we published, I published a case study. Of course, it's a low level of evidence, but uh, we were doing it to kind of demonstrate a point, which is why I think you, <laughs> you do case work. Um, and we compared uh, these, these uh, symptom reports and um, also these um, uh, cardiopulmonary exercise test findings between people with various different forms of fatigue. And what shook out as being unique among all of these people with these different fatigue presentations after a maximal cardiopulmonary exercise test, mm. uh, actually two of them back to back separated by 24 hours, is the people with MECFS were the only ones who actually got worse on the second day. Everyone else was able to maintain their cardiopulmonary exercise test performance, and they they reported feeling terrible and they reported feeling fatigued, but they were able to maintain a, a, a reproducible test result. Uh, but folks with MECFS uh, did not; they were not able to do that. So a high functioning person with MECFS uh, tended to have a little bit higher starting point, but still came down. Uh, and a person who is lower functioning uh, maybe started lower, but still came down. And so we know that, you know, physiologically speaking, that there's a decrement uh, in the ability to maintain, you know, sort of that metabolic state that allows you to function from day to day. So there seems to be some, you know, this fluctuation that we observe in terms of symptoms seems to have a physiological basis. And, and this, this, uh, you know, the symptom presentations that we find are, are quite are quite variable. Of course, they all involve some kind of fatigue, whatever that means, right? But <laughs> on that scale that we talked about, um, but that there are other things that are just really unusual in terms of uh, responses to activity that, that we, we physios and rehab people would just not recognize as being a normal response. Mm. Um, so things like, you know, a runny nose and uh, feeling like you're getting sick and being weak and numbness and tingling um, cognitive deficits, we call it brain fog. Uh, and I know that you you've talked a lot about this already. Um, we don't normally expect that as a, as an activity response. No. Um, and a whole host of other, you know, types of, of, of symptoms that I'm not thinking about right now, but uh, have been pretty well laid out in the literature. Um, and so when we talk about fatigue, as you point out, you know, there, I think there are two points to be made. The first is that it's not just fatigue, it's other things too. Mm. Uh, this post-exertional malaise, or uh, I, almost, I almost prefer the, uh, the synonym that for post-exertional malaise of post-exertional neuroimmune exhaustion, which comes from the Canadian consensus criteria or the international consensus criteria for, uh, for MECFS, uh, because I think it's a little more descriptive. Yes. Um, and, and the other point to be made there is that uh, this isn't in people's heads that it's correlated with, 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 phys, with phys, a, a kind of verifiable, objectively obtained physiological data. Um, so we can't turn around and say, well, um, because we've commoditized activity so well, and we think of being industrious 
as being a strong character kind of in our our Western societies. Can't think about this as as being a drag on you know someone's uh, ability to produce within society. And we can't think about this as a personality flaw, right? yeah, yeah. which is kind of the way we think about fatigue. Um, because there's there's objective data to support that it exists. There's objective data to support that you know there are uh, physiological underpinnings to the fluctuations that we see, and that uh, just believing patients, you know, we, we know that the the symptom presentation of this quote unquote fatigue mm. is highly variable and very unusual. And that's fascinating because I think like if I think of my own experiences, it has been the knowledge and skills of communities of people living with MECFS that have helped me get through my journey because I've had very similar symptoms. Um, to what you described there. I've had these post-viral complications, whether they be the same or different, I don't know, but they're similar for sure. Um, and I know that post-exertion malaise that I experienced or the post-exertional um, neuro, what did you call it? Neuroimmune exhaustion. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, when that was triggered, it was a cluster of symptoms that I would get. It wasn't just exhaustion. It was a cluster right. of other things as well that came along with it. Um, and at its worst included pain as well, which was very, like in my, yeah. it was really strange, you know, like I couldn't figure that bit out. It was like my bones were burning. Um, but I, 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 I think it's really interesting that obviously we, we're, we're learning so much in different and additional directions, but also coming to that point you made, I think also the challenges that have been historical are also appearing in the context of long COVID about, um, you mentioned about it being in our heads, <laughs> you know, and that's a real thing at the moment. Um, even it seems to be that the studies that are being funded for the treatment of long COVID seems to focus on mental health and exercise interventions. Um, yeah, and I, I, and I've said this, on, this is nothing I haven't already said on that, on that bird app Twitter, but, uh, <laughs> but just to <laughs> reiterate here for your, your podcast viewers and listeners who maybe aren't, aren't on the app. Um, it seems as though we're making, we're making the same mistakes we made with MECFS faster and at yep. scale with long COVID. Yeah. Um, and, and so I, I'm, I'm aware of, of the groups that are out working with exercise, working with uh, thinking about illness adjustments, uh, thinking about cognitive behavioral therapy and, and motivational interviewing. Um, and, and in full disclosure, I was a psychology major. I actually came to physical therapy from a psychology background. Mm -hmm. um, so that was actually my undergraduate degree. Um, and so I, I don't see those things in and of themselves are, are evil, but I do see them, and, and I, but I see them as being largely misapplied mm -hmm. um, because they're not addressing the energy deficits that we see, the metabolic pathway deficits that we see, that we've measured uh, in MECFS, uh, not the autonomic um, deficits that we've seen in MECFS that I would surmise are similar to long COVID just based on the fact that we're seeing the same kind of symptom presentation. Yes. Um, and, and also in, in somewhat fairness, the, um, the, there may be a role for, for some of that because of some of the secondary consequences of, of MECFS and long COVID. Uh, it affects relationships. Um, it, um, it affects people's function and their self-worth. Um, so there are, there are potential secondary consequences that, that you know, the traumas that may need to be addressed. But I think that, I think that thinking about MECFS and, and long COVID as a primary psychopathology is traumatizing of itself. Yeah. Uh, and so that's, that's a, again, goes to that, that mistake that I think we're. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I really kind of like the way that you worded that, which is that the same mistakes are happening again, but they seem to be at larger scale and accelerated with more funding thrown at those mistakes. Um, Cause that does feel very real. And I think, you know, like from my own personal perspective on this, it, it is um, really difficult to see that, that those same mistakes are being happening again. But I think it's also because we don't really understand what long COVID is without recognizing um, 
the the lessons that we can translate from other areas like post viral complications or MECFS right. and we need it feels like we're not learning those lessons quick enough uh, we're making the same mistakes again yeah it's and it's hard because long COVID is at least four different things exactly um, at least right so and I'm I'm a I'm a lumper not a splitter so <laughs> I'm, I'm <laughs> right now <laughs> right. You know, you have this MECFS type presentation. Mm -hmm. You have uh, post viral deconditioning because you've been laid up in bed. You have uh, post ICU syndrome for people who have severe cases. Um, and then you have the consequences of direct organ damage. Um, and so, you know, only one of those things is really classically MECFS type, you know, sort of however we want to think about this, this kind of, uh, kind of type of long COVID uh, in which exercise is. Uh, is harmful in the early stages. And for the other three, it is possible um, that exercise can help. So, um, so you know, again, I, I think we need to get savvier about differentiating between the types of long COVID, mm -hmm. uh, just as we've tried to become savvier over time in differentiating and trying to really characterize that cluster of, of symptoms and signs that, that, that does a good job of picking out people with MECFS. Yes, uh, or kind of how we how we clinically would characterize that because we don't have a gold standard test uh, aside from uh, mm. really post uh, cardiopulmonary exercise test results. I think that's um, a really important point you raised as well about there being these different uh, subgroups, phenotypes. I hate the word syndromes, but that's one word that's being used mm -hmm. uh, to describe these different uh, groupings of people under the large umbrella term of long COVID. And, I, and something that actually Jenny Setchell said in the podcast from last week, which is where she was cri um, critically appraising the approach of medicalization of exercise. Uh, one of the things she actually said, which really stuck with me, is let's be a little bit more purposefully complex about this. Um, and it, that really applies to this, doesn't it? In the fact that we can't yes. just blanket say exercise works in this because there is clearly a subgroup, subset, phenotype, whatever you want to call it, of people where it doesn't seem to be working. And I think pretty much everyone in our long COVID physio group has slipped into that group because we've all right. connected because we've bizarrely found exercise so detrimental to our health and we're all physios that are so used to exercising and promoting it so we've just collectively come together yeah, you, you, you not only have the the collective illness experience but you also have the collective professional identity crisis that yeah. told over time that exercise is great and I, mm. you know, I can't say enough good things about your last podcast with dr setchell and she's fantastic uh, oh. i really enjoyed listening to that because i think we do need to critically interrogate um, this idea of exercise as medicine um, for a lot of different reasons. And I also think we need to, to critically uh, interrogate this idea that exercise is good for everyone. Yes. Similar to the fact that it, it, even if we thought exercise was medicine, we wouldn't prescribe medicine to everybody. Uh, <laughs> there are reasons that we don't have Prozac in the water, right? Like we don't, we don't just blanket prescribed medication. So, so I, I like that idea of purposeful complexity. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I enjoyed that podcast as well. I won't lie. Um, yeah, so it sounds like then, obviously what we need to do is we need to identify those people pretty rapidly at the moment, um, I would say, because ev the responses to this pandemic seem to be moving rather rapidly as well. And I think that yeah. the responses are moving quicker than the science. Um, that we need to identify those people who are potentially going to experience harm to exercise or exertion. Um, how do you think we can best identify them? Who are they? So I'm aware of a few efforts that are ongoing to try and get at it through chart review, retrospective chart review, and try and figure out a, a set of, of variables that can be you know, used or tracked or so forth. Um, the, the, where, where I think we probably can make our best um, inroads with this question is using biometric data from wearables. Um, at some point uh, in this disease process, people's autonomic system, for lack of a better term, goes off the rails. Um, there are sort of inappropriate um, accelerations of heart rate, probably um, changes in heart rate variability, 
Uh, and I, those are things that I think we need to look into and that our group is, is trying to sort of start to get some projects together along those lines. Um, one of the things that I know about many of the, the groups that you know, the physio groups and, and some of the other, some of the other patient groups in long COVID is that uh, folks have been wearing their Garmin, their Fitbits, their Garmin's, their what have you for a long time, right? <laughs> and so, <laughs> so we, we actually have the advantage of pre-illness data and post illness data that we don't necessarily have with MECFS owing to the significant diagnostic delay yeah. in MECFS. Um, and so I really do think that, you know, taking a snapshot in time before the illness and a snapshot in time after, and kind of just taking a look at how these things are different and then identify where those differences start to manifest is probably our best, our best bet. Um, I have a, again, there's a, there's a couple of colleagues here in the States who are, who are trying to sort of look into this and our, our, our group is trying to look into this. And I think that's probably mm. the most objective way to handle this. And that's um, almost like, um, it, it's a, it's a really effective way as well, isn't it? Because it's almost like, it's almost an opportunity for big data as well, isn't it? To, to look at this from an incredibly large volume of people, obviously with consent, um, to, to really get to hand a grip on something that we all potentially have. Um, right. Not everyone in the world has wearables, obviously, um, but there, there are a certain volume of people that do, and it could be a really uh, effective tool. Um, like I know that, for me, God, my heart rate has done the weird and wonderful things. And actually that's why I'm still waiting for cardiological investigations because it didn't make any sense what was going on with my heart rate. It was all over the shop. And yeah, to be exactly. honest, it is. Yeah. yeah. And that's that's pretty common. Um, and so we've, we've actually started, and this kind of follows from the, the observation that um, the, the aerobic system is, is impaired in people with MECFS, mm -hmm. uh, that we know sort of that breakpoint at ventilatory anaerobic threshold uh, from cardiopulmonary exercise testing. Uh, we identify where that heart rate is, and then we use that as the basis for uh, activity pace and self-management. And so we have people, they don't have a Fitbit, they don't have a Garmin, they don't have a Polar. Uh, we ask them to get one and then set an alarm at that ventilatory anaerobic threshold. Um, and so, so now we're basically reverse engineering that observation onto, okay, when did all of this, when did all this start? When did the evidence start? Um, and so we're, we're looking forward to unpacking that question. Mm. And uh, am I right in thinking that it was also uh, yourself that came up with the suggestion of uh, um, uh, the heart rate monitoring as keeping you below your uh, threshold um, to prevent post-exertion malaise? Is that right? Yeah. This is, this is a work well idea uh, that's been floating around for, for 10, 12, 14 years. Uh, and we've, we've refined it over time in terms of those recommendations. There's a, uh, if you navigate over to the work well website, we're actually doing a VIP webinar on heart rate monitoring, mm -hmm. uh, where we'll have a couple of exercise physiologists talk a little bit about the underlying uh, physiology of uh, heart rate monitoring, uh, some of the nuts and bolts of the kind of daily mechanics of how that works. And then we'll talk, uh, talk about some uh, patient cases kind of how to, how to provide impact mm. for people in their self pacing self-management programs based on their heart rate data. I know that um, it was actually physios for ME that recommended to myself to do heart rate monitoring because uh, of the symptoms I was experiencing. And it was very effective. And I know that certainly in our, only in our long, um, long COVID physio group this week, uh, a couple of people have been sharing their personal experiences of longitudinal improvement through mm -hmm. utilizing heart rate monitoring where they've been able to keep below their target of, I think- yeah. It, uh, you know, which is very difficult, but they've been able to do that and notice changes over time in their improvements. Um, yeah, it's uh, we we had a had a case study that we we published. Oh gosh, maybe eight, nine years ago, uh, about a one year follow up in someone who who followed this pacing program. So again, casework, right? But it's it's proof of concept and it's kind of trying to demonstrate a point to to, mm. to fuel fuel curiosity and and maybe some future for future research. Uh, and this person demonstrated an improvement in symptoms and also an improvement in her cardiopulmonary exercise test results mm -hmm. uh, at the end of that year. So um, it's, it seems like it could, could be a very promising way to go. And certainly based on what we have patients telling us and based on the results of patient surveys, mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that this, uh, this pacing self-management strategy, mm -hmm. uh, especially biometrically based, can be very and I suppose the nice thing about that approach as well is obviously it's something that is objective. 
It's something that people can, uh, or clinicians can monitor and observe, but also people themselves can self-monitor and observe, as you said, for self-management. But I suppose the other thing with it as well is that it doesn't mean that you then need to, if you are able to move and do things and potentially even exert yourself and keep yourself right. below that threshold, you can continue to do it safely without triggering symptoms. And, and I, I suppose I find it interesting that the, um, people that are very much promoting exercise in the area of this um, haven't got on board with that as much because it almost would enable people to keep moving if they were capable of moving at that level. Um, it, I find that quite interesting. Yeah, it's. Um, I, I don't necessarily have an explanation for that. <laughs> <laughs> I was. <laughs> it wasn't again, a question. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a. It's a great observation, and uh, and and again, it's just we're 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 making the same mistakes at a greater scale. Um, mm. But I, I will add too that I think uh, kind of biometrically based pacing self management programs do provide the ability to look into the future a little bit. That you know, the, the hard part about long COVID and, and MECFS is that it's really hard to predict the quantity of energy you're going to have in the future. Yes. Uh, I don't know what tomorrow is going to, going to look like. So if I have a good day today, I'm going to go to the store. Uh, you know, I'm going to spend time with friends. Uh, this is a good day. And we'll just, whatever is tomorrow is going to bring is what tomorrow is going to bring. Um, but I think what, I think what this style of pacing self-management program provides is uh, the opportunity to think about, you know, here's what I'm doing now, here's metabolically what it is doing. I am over on my watch. Um, I will probably feel crummy tomorrow mm -hmm. versus I am under on my watch. I know that I'm using metabolic pathways that still function well. And it is likely that I will have, it is more likely that I will have a sufficient amount of energy to do something tomorrow. So I think just that planning is, is so helpful because the uncertainty of of these two diseases on COVID and MECFS is just is just one of the, the yeah. another challenging feature on top of a, a challenging disease. Absolutely, and I, I suppose that's why so many people, are, either with MECFS or now with long COVID as well, are also um, or whatever you want to call any of these things, <laughs> um, are, are are reporting when they do have these these symptoms that are exacerbated by exertion. Um, that that heart rate monitoring is actually really an effective methodology of supporting their pacing, because uh, like right. you just said, they can plan and prioritize eff effectively, uh, and they can keep a bit of a tabs on it. It's something really quite tangible, um, even if it is challenging um, to do. Um, especially with the boom and the bus cycles that seem to be uh, the, the, the inevitable, but <laughs> <laughs> when you're, uh, and when your your watch beeps, when you're brushing your teeth, it's, it's hard, you know, and, and so you're, you have to find different ways to do things that, that bring down that metabolic cost. And so yeah. there's, there's definitely, it's, it's sort of not just listening for the beep. It's, there's definitely a, an element, I think, of skilled care for, for physical therapists, occupational therapists, and rehab folks to to really be able to help problem solve mm. patients. Absolutely, yeah. there's no one to yeah. So after we've validated the symptom experience, right, we've actually listened to people uh, for maybe the first time <laughs> in, in the entire sort of illness experience, uh, we have the opportunity to use our knowledge and skills and, and research uh, background to, uh, to be able to help people live better. And that's, that's the exciting thing for me. Yeah, absolutely. And if, if, there, if it is a tool that could encourage uh, that greater therapeutic relationship between the clinician and the person living with the condition, um, then that's an incredible thing because you, right. you'd, you'd think it wouldn't be a big ask to work in collaboration, but obviously there is, there is scope for better. Uh, right. Certainly. I know one of the questions that I'm desperate to ask you, and I'm going to dive in, uh, is uh, at the moment, um, I know that you said that maybe it's preferential to use the term post-exertional uh, neuroimmune exhaustion. I think some people are also using post-exertion malaise. Some people are talking about symptoms that are exacerbated by exertion. Um, hopefully we're covering all different uh, different terminologies so people know what we're talking about but people are really interested in it because yeah. it seems to be like it's something we should be screening for mm -hmm. in the context of how do we provide safer rehabilitation interventions so I know that 
I've obviously been following your work and I've been trying to share with people with who have come to me and asked, and I'm certainly no expert in this, um, some ideas and tips, but it's actually quite a difficult field to, um, to, to advise, I found to advise on how to measure or screen. And so I'm gonna ask you, <laughs> what, what, how should we, we be measuring and screening for post-exertion malaise? <laughs> <laughs> it's a really it's a really good question and you know post exertion malaise is probably the most common term i use it uh and i use it in our publications i don't think it's optimally descriptive but i, I agree with you that there's so many different ways that that we describe it and partially because you know we say well fatigue but what we mean is this and then pretty we're, we're 10 10 steps down the road of and pretty soon we've got, you know, an entire dissertation of what we actually mean because we just don't have the, the word to optimally describe it. Um, but I'll come back to that in a moment. I, so in my, in my clinical practice, uh, I spend a lot of time um, using a more narrative approach. I ask people what, the, what their symptoms are and what they mean. I ask people to prioritize their symptoms if they can. Uh, what are your top three symptoms? Um, and, and people are generally pretty, pretty good about coming up with the three things that they wish they, they didn't have to experience that would make their lives a little easier. Um, and then we talk about, you know, what, what exacerbates the symptom. And so that's a, that's a little harder. Yeah. Um, and so often, you know, that takes a couple of weeks to a month of journaling mm -hmm. uh, to really have people explore, okay, well, you know, these three symptoms tend to go together and they come on when I do X, Y, and Z. You'd think that'd be a fairly easy question to answer, but it's just not. Mm. Um, and so I spend a lot of time asking people to journal. Um, now I know that, and, and I think through this, Darren, you have a chance to augment the therapeutic relationship because you get a chance to get to know the patient, the patient gets a chance to get to know you, mm -hmm. um, and you get a chance to really sort of learn about the context of the symptoms, not just the nature and the duration and the intensity, but also the context and sort of how this is affecting the person. Um, and I think I think that's helpful because again, um, you know, validation is important. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot of folks out there that look at fatigue as, as, and this is very pejorative and not my words, but they look at, at folks who, who have fatigue as lazy or crazy. And uh, that's, you know, that's, if you've heard this narrative mm -hmm. from, other people, including other healthcare practitioners, you know, we have a lot of work to do to unpack that. So that's how I look at the world clinically. It's 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 a much more narrative approach. Uh, it's I'm I'm trying to co-create a treatment plan, so I'm I'm, I'm highly collaborative in that regard. Um, and um, and the way I think about things as a researcher is slightly different. Sorry, <laughs> say that again. The way I think about things as a researcher is slightly different. Ah. So I, I, have, I have my clinician over here and my, my researcher on the shoulder. So the researcher in me says that we need to get to the answer in a fairly parsimonious way that allows us to be fairly uh, discriminative between MECFS and other types of health conditions. Um, and it would be great if we could somehow boil down this gray spectrum of disability into a number. How great would that be? Mm. Um, and so, um, so there are a few questionnaires out there that, that can be used to um, discriminate between MECFS. They have just some discriminative value. And so the DePaul symptom questionnaire is one of those that, that I'm, I'm, I'm high on. Um, also, um, there's symptom checklists through the United States CDC um, that can be used that are fairly simple, straightforward. If you're looking for a more descriptive approach, uh, the Canadian consensus criteria uh, are a really good way to um, have people sort of um, describe a little bit more, a little bit more long form what symptoms are. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I probably favor that one the most in the clinic because it, it meets the need for some structure, but it also provides the opportunity for me to, to be a little bit more open. Um, and so, so that's, that's the discriminative function of measuring PEP. Um, the longitudinal assessment, the more evaluative function, the change over time, we yeah. don't have a sense of how to do that yet. Okay. Um, and so this is, this is harder. Yeah. Uh, and some of the work that we did, gosh, almost 10 years ago, uh, it has been 10 years. 
um, was in using uh, the medical outcomes survey short form 36 yes. and the multidimensional fatigue inventory. And what we found was that, you know, these, these questionnaires can be highly reliable with patients with MECFS in this case, and I would surmise on COVID, but we haven't tested that yet. So I should, I should think of that caveat. But both the MFI and the short form 36 demonstrated significant floor effects where people with MECFS rated themselves so low mm. on that spectrum that there's no way you could show change. <laughs> you can show better, but you couldn't show worse. So there, so that so the evaluative you know function of those questionnaires, that longitudinal assessment of disability over time, is basically worthless. Mm. Um, and so, and I think we're probably going to end up um, having that problem just because there's such a spectrum of disability in post-viral fatigue. Um, so what we played around with, and I think I don't think we were the only group to do this. There might have been a group that published on this, and I, I haven't I haven't looked, but would like to. Is actually modifying hospice scales. Uh, scales See that bit that again? Are, sorry, I didn't quite hear that bit. Modifying yeah. the what? Sorry. Modifying hospice scales. Oh. So um, you know these are these are functional scales that are used you know, at, at the end of life and in hospice uh, in very low functioning patients. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, but ultimately, that's that's sort of the next frontier is to find a scale where you would mitigate those four effects. And so that's one of those that is um, that is a potential candidate. Um, but I think it all comes back to um, asking patients, doing a really careful job of understanding that symptom experience and, and co-creating these questionnaires with, with particular patient groups. Mm. So that's really interesting, isn't it? Because obviously you've then got not only the clinical experience where uh, taking your more narrative approach, um, which from, uh, you know, if we were th to think about clinicians full stop, they need to know what post-exertion malaise is to be, to be able to adopt that approach. Um, right. So there's a lot of work, I suppose, on getting more clinicians uh, on, on board and savvy and aware of this. And maybe a global pandemic is the opportunity for that. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, but then obviously with the research side, you know, as you mentioned, there are tools. There's the objective stuff around um, wearables and uh, you mentioned cardiopulmonary exercise testing or CPET testing and or two-day CPETs and then some other tools as well, but there's limitations. And the biggest limitation is the longitudinal evaluation of that. So measuring right. change over time. So how do things get better or worse? And it really reminds me of the work that's done in the context of HIV around episodic disability, um, which is that we know that the disability that's experienced by people is, is fluctuating or changes over time. So hence is episodic. And the, diff the challenges of measuring episodic disability is what's the natural course of an episode of change and what's actually a stepwise improvement or decrement in right. functioning or disability um so that that's work that hasn't been done yet uh, and still is is to be done and i suppose with something that is so episodic and fluctuating like post-exertion malaise and seems to be also very unpredictable at times as well it is going to be really difficult to measure over time, isn't it? Um, it is. So, so yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a big challenge. But I wonder now seems like the right time for more minds to join your crew and and get on board yeah. with it and look at this in more in 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 hopefully different lenses as well. Yeah, couldn't agree more with that sentiment. That where where you ended, I, and, and I I would add too that there's such a challenge that if we're going to do intervention studies. Uh, you know, if we, if we don't have very good symptom related endpoints for these intervention studies, disability related endpoints for these intervention studies. Mm. And so what you end up doing is you end up counting recovered versus not recovered, you know, in kind of an arbitrary way by asking the patient, are you better? Well, I guess I'm better. Okay, then you're recovered. Uh, and, you know, there's a little more nuance to it than that, but, but ultimately that's, that's sort of what it boils down to. And so you don't end up with being able to appreciate any uh, you know, gradation in between recovered and not recovered. Yeah. Um, and so it's a, it's a huge challenge. So it challenges our understanding of how good our interventions can be. Yeah. And I suppose that's where I'm actually a little bit pleased at the moment that the World Health Organization have produced their uh, case report form on what they're calling um, uh, post COVID-19 condition now, which I think mm -hmm. is that potentially their their term they're going to use for long right. COVID. Everyone's got a different term. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the club. You know what I mean? <laughs> 
<laughs> but um, what they've done in that is they've included this enormous section on symptom checklist. Yes, no, do you have it? Post-exertion yeah. malaise is actually included in that. Yeah. Um, but the other thing they've included is the World Health Organization's disability assessment schedule, which is uh, just mm -hmm. a, a, a 12 point questionnaire that looks at functioning in day-to-day -day life. Uh, it enables you to score it on a Likert scale. And when it's transformed, it gives you a, um, a, a linear, um, a, sorry, a continuous scale of zero to 100, where zero mm -hmm. is no disability, 100 is full disability. So actually, I'm hopeful that if the World Health Organization is using this, there might be a little bit more um, uh, nuance to people mm -hmm. change over time. Like the difficulty with the HUDAS is that it's actually used mostly for population studies in terms of measuring yeah. ability. But, um, you know, it, I suppose there is an opportunity here. Whereas if it's on that scale of 100, like it could show episodic changes, who knows? But, you know, there, there's only really one tool I know of that measures episodic disability mm -hmm. and that's that's the that's the HIV disability questionnaire whether that be the long mm -hmm. or the short form um so I think you know there's lots of work to do isn't there around um identifying the symptoms recognizing the symptoms addressing the symptoms measuring the symptoms and then looking at how they fluctuate and change <laughs> so it's quite a lot of work in there <laughs> It's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a lot to ask you a single questionnaire. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I agree with you that there are some, I, I, I like the sentiment of, of having more people on board in the fields to, to be able to, to cross validate some of these questionnaires and kind of think about these questions in a way that we haven't thought about before. Mm. Um, and, and I think it's all hands on deck, you know, just like it's been from from kind of day one uh, before the pandemic was declared, you know, it was uh, trying to understand uh, what what this disease is and, and what what it does and how to prevent it and how to keep people safe. Um, and that that work was ongoing uh, even into even into long COVID. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know, with the all hands on deck as well, we've seen how effective it can be, haven't we? In terms of countries that have done very well with uh, a, a zero COVID approach, you know, elimination approach, you know, they've been very successful at that when it's all hands on deck. Um, and yeah. then also global responses to vaccination, you know, wow, yeah. what a turnaround that was. Um, yeah. So I'm hoping as well that all hands on deck in terms of disability and rehabilitation, um, because ultimately, um, if it is all hands on deck, we've learned so much from MECFS, and I really hope that there's a lot more that can be learned still, but the, the learning and the translation of information in different and additional directions will hopefully, whatever happens in long COVID will help in other areas too. Um, and there's so much that can merge to this and benefit so many people. And I, I really, 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 really hope for that. You know, and I, I'll also add that uh, the glue that holds this all together is good science communication. Mm. And so I, I want to credit your podcast and Long Physio Group, uh, the, the, the physios for ME, uh, the PTOT uh, group on Facebook, uh, for just doing a wonderful job of bringing together clinicians mm. and bringing together patient groups uh, in order to, to really engage in this um, and, and give the patients perspective. I think it's just so critical and valuable and in, in chronic conditions across the board, but in particular MECFS, it's totally neglected. Uh, and, uh, and so thank you for your voices. Oh, well, that, that, thank you for saying so. Like, I, I, I suppose my, my area of practice, as I've mentioned, is HIV and HIV is grounded in the greater involvement and meaningful engagement of people living with the conditions and also affected by the conditions. Um, and so it feels kind of really natural um, to have community engagement in all of the responses. Um, right. I suppose I'm finding it a bit alien that I'm, I'm a community member now and I'm calling for greater involvement and I don't know that I always see it. Um, so I, I find that interesting and fascinating, but um, I was going to ask you another question, if that was all right. Please. Um, you mentioned that we may be making the same mistakes. If you had your way, magic wand, I don't know. Uh, a bit <laughs> How, what would you, what are the mistakes that shouldn't be made and what should we be doing? So I think one of the mistakes that we've, we've made over time with MECFS is we've forgotten to 
listen to the patient. Um, and so this is why I'm so gratified for the patient groups in long COVID, uh, because I think we're, I think, I think there's some, some, some strength in numbers, uh, you know, the ability to use social media to, to sort of broadcast that, hey, this is, this is different <laughs> than, than we might expect. Uh, here's our, here's been our experience. Uh, to be able to leverage your your background as a clinician, as a physical therapist, I think is really important uh, because I think it gives you a different platform and a different voice to be able to speak. Um, and so, so I didn't have to wave a magic wand. That stuff's already happening. Uh, I guess where where I would wave the magic wand is uh, for folks who are not living with long COVID, not living with MECFS, to to listen, honor, and validate the symptom experience of people who do. Um, and um, that's. That's going to take a lot of a lot of pixie dust <laughs> to make that happen because it's it's human nature not to not to understand something that you're not you're not living with. Yeah. Um, but I, I would say that would be the first step uh, is is to listen to honor and to validate. And I, and I'd say the second step really is to start to, to try and understand um, at a at a metabolic level what's happening. Uh, try and try and figure out what these how these phenotypes differ. Mm -hmm. um, and to provide funding for folks who are in position to not necessarily be quite so siloed in any one phenotype, but really are positioned within either teams or on the strength of one's uh, diverse background in science to be able to, to differentiate between those, those phenotypes on a more descriptive level that then can give us some information to drill deeper within each silo. Uh, and I think that's, that's a, a feature of the medical community, just being so highly specialized, the scientific community being so highly specialized that you, mm -hmm. I, there's a slide that I have in my PowerPoints when I introduce the diagnosis of NECFS, of, of what is this? And, you know, all of these blindfolded people are, are touching an elephant. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> got, you know, people saying, oh, this is leather and no, this you're touching the tusk. No, this is a spear. And so, you know, people call it different things partially as a result of their different training. And I, I just think that we need, we need more translational folks up front and we need more uh, some systems level thinkers up front mm. uh, before we dive down. So again, it's this, this whole going from the bench to the bedside, I feel like we're missing a crucial step and that crucial step is uh, the ability to integrate um, and the ability to, to characterize broadly before we, we drill down. Um, and, then, and then I think too, um, I think, History doesn't doesn't echo, but it rhymes. Um, MECFS and long COVID are similar enough that we can we can continue to learn. Um, I know that the 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 patient community in MECFS has been sounding the alarm on long COVID before long COVID was a thing. <laughs> and so, <laughs> what, what I'd really what I would really like to see is more application of what we already know. Yes. Um, instead of pretending that, that we know nothing and we're starting from scratch. Uh, I, I don't think that's the case. I think it's I think it wastes time. Uh, I think there may be some important differences that we don't know about yet between long COVID and MECFS. Yeah. Uh, as we learn more, uh, those will come to light. But I think we know enough now to get started that um, that we don't necessarily have to design the same studies that we would have done you know, 15 years ago in MECFS uh, in order to see if they work in long COVID. Uh, I think we know enough now that yeah. they don't. So I guess, uh, I don't know, do I get three magic wands? Because I think that was probably three things. No, if you want a third, you can have a third. Like I've got a, ba I've got a bag of pixie dust here. So I mean, like... <laughs> Perfect. So um, at this point then, I'm thinking that we've covered quite a lot, haven't we? We've covered kind of um, your work. Uh, at the Workwell Foundation and also uh, clinically and academically. Um, the similarities and differences maybe of long COVID and uh, MECFS, diagnostics, uh, symptoms, characterization, thinking about post-exertion malaise or whatever we want to call it, um, and how to potentially assess it and recognizing that that's actually still a difficult thing to do. Um, and I, I know that's not gonna impress the people that want to do scientific studies and wanna, <laughs> wanna, wanna get, want the answer now. Um, and then also thinking about like things for the future. But I know that there is lots and lots and lots of opportunity for learning 
already out there. So if you could kind of take this moment to kind of pitch the places that you would direct people that wanted to learn more, uh, say they've listened to this podcast and just needed more info, where would you signpost people to? Yeah, I, I, would, I would send people to the WorkWell Foundation website. We have recordings of lectures that we've done in, uh, nationally and internationally. We have uh, patient-oriented uh, handouts and brochures. Um, I would point to uh, the MedBridge uh, continuing education course that we have done on MECFS mm -hmm. uh, that is up there. Um, I would point to uh, Physios for ME, uh, the PTOT group on, on Facebook. Uh, and uh, just so many great places to, to to get trusted information. Great. Well, I, if you're happy for us to, what we will certainly do is link to all of those things at the bottom of this podcast so that people can access them directly. So I, I don't know that I've got a final question for you, Todd, um, but I wonder if there's anything more that you would like to share that maybe we haven't covered that you would have hoped that we had. You know, we've covered a lot and I certainly do appreciate that. And I, I guess the, the thing to share is to, to thank your, you and your listeners for, uh, for caring about this, uh, for making this a priority uh, and for, uh, for the, the privilege of your time and your attention. Oh, that's very kind of you, Todd. Thank you very much. Well, I, I, I am incredibly grateful for your time and all of your work and your passion and dedication to this because it helps many, many people um, and selfishly, including myself. Um, so thank you very much for your time, Todd. Um, so I will end the recording now, if that's okay.